Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at ChooseWood.com. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. They're worried that digitizing mail is putting one more barrier in between incarcerated people and their families. When we know that those kinds of family connections are, are critical for rebuilding a life when someone leaves prison. Staff had found fentanyl, meth, um, synthetic marijuana in the creases of envelopes, inside greeting cards, or even soaked into the paper itself. Prison officials say this is going to help stop drugs from entering correctional facilities. Reporters at the Texas Tribune interviewed over a dozen people who either worked in Texas prisons or were incarcerated there who said the main source of drugs in prison were actually the staff members themselves. This is a problem that we are seeing here in Missouri, too. It's un- clear how much these mail restrictions are actually going to help solve the problem. So this is kind of big business going on in these prisons. There's there's a real profit for Securus there. Inmates won't have any other choice but to share their private correspondence with this third party for-profit company. It just takes the humanity out of it. If someone's child is, is sending something to you, being able to even feel potentially like the texture of the crayon I can smell my mom's perfume on this letter. I'm Sarah Fenske. Beginning July 1st, inmates at Missouri prisons may no longer receive mail from family members or loved ones. Instead, their mail must be sent to a processing center to be scanned, and inmates can then view the correspondence on screen. Missouri Department of Corrections spokeswoman Karen Pogeman says the new policy is intended to reduce the spread of contraband. She told St. Louis Public Radio reporter Shayla Farzan that prison staff have found drugs hidden under stamps, in the creases of envelopes, inside greeting cards, or even soaked into the paper itself. Well, one of the benefits is that this reduces the the time um, for staff. We have staff in the mail rooms who have to sort through all of the mail and check everything for anything suspicious. Um, And then we also have inspectors who get involved if something suspicious is found. So it's a real drain on staff time. Um, And we do have, like every other Department of Corrections, we have a a statewide staffing shortage. And joining us now with more on this story is the reporter behind it. That is St. Louis Public Radio, Shayla Farzan. Shayla, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So, Shayla, drugs have always or almost always been a problem in prison. What's the impetus for this change in mail protocol? Yeah, so corrections officials gave me kind of two major reasons why they're moving to digital mail only. Um, One major reason is that they say they're trying to keep drugs from entering Missouri prisons through the mail, as you mentioned in the intro here. Um, So Karen Pojman, the prison official with the Missouri Department of Corrections, told me that in just the first quarter of this year, um, you know, staff had found fentanyl, meth, um, synthetic marijuana, and other drugs that people were trying to send to inmates through the mail. Um, So they say that this is a big issue and, you know, making electronic copies of mail is going to help tackle it. Um, One thing to mention is that they weren't able to share data on the number of times they've intercepted drugs in the mail. So it's hard to know how often this is actually happening. Mm -hmm. Um, The other reason that they gave is that they're trying to save staff time. So in the prison mailroom, you have workers who are opening up every single piece of mail and checking it, not only for drugs, but um, you know, also for other kind of inappropriate content, other contraband that might be concealed inside, like um, cell phone prison, uh, cell phone SIM cards, for instance. Um, but that process of opening up the mail and checking it is really time consuming. And the department has been struggling with a a statewide shortage of corrections workers for for a number of years now. Mm -hmm. Um, So they're hoping that by outsourcing the mail to this private company, they can move workers who would have been processing mail to other jobs and sort of limit the pain of that staff shortage. Is Missouri unique in in trying this whole idea of a processing center and, and having mail sent there? No, you know, Missouri is not actually unique. So 
Some other states have made similar moves in the past couple years. Um, so Pennsylvania, um, New Mexico, North Carolina, Florida, they've all started digitizing inmates' mail. Um, and I should also say that the um, Federal Bureau of Prisons also piloted a similar kind of program in about 18 states. Um, so they all have sort of slightly different rules and are paying different private companies to scan inmates' mail. But the basic idea is the same and the reasoning is the same. It, basically, prison officials say this is going to help stop drugs from entering correctional facilities. So do we know if that's happening for the states that have tried it? Any any real-world examples we could point to? Yeah, so some real world examples. I mean, I think that partly it's tough to be able to actually say whether these are working, Mm -hmm. um, whether digitizing mail is stopping the flow of drugs in prisons. Um, So one potential example that's a little bit different comes out of Texas. Um, So Texas, uh, during the pandemic, began um, limiting mail and also um, putting some restrictions on in-person visits, like a lot of prisons. Um, Those mail restrictions in Texas are a little bit different than what we're talking about here. Um, So they basically kind of banned all um, store-bought greeting cards and colored paper, um, cards made with kind of glue and glitter and paint. Um, And so what that meant in Texas was that, uh, you know, friends and family could still send personal mail, but they could only send sort of plain white printer paper in plain envelopes to anyone who was incarcerated in Texas. Hmm. Um, So unlike Missouri, you know, which will allow inmates to only receive digital copies of mail, in Texas they were still getting personal mail. As far as the impact of of this, I mean, I think that from a research standpoint, it can be a little bit difficult to measure when something didn't happen, right? Um, But an investigation from the Texas Tribune and the Marshall Project last year found that um, drugs were still entering prisons in Texas despite those new restrictive mail policies. So reporters with the Texas Tribune interviewed over a dozen people who either worked in Texas prisons or were incarcerated there after these changes went into effect. And the people that they interviewed said the problem had actually gotten worse. Hmm. So they were actually interviewing some prison guards who said the main source of drugs in prison were actually the staff members themselves. So essentially, low-paid employees are smuggling drugs into prisons and then selling them to inmates. Um, and again, I think the, you know, the restrictions in Texas are pretty different than what we're talking about here in Missouri. Um, but it is worth noting that our investigations at St. Louis Public Radio have also found that correctional officers are smuggling drugs into Missouri prisons and selling them, Mm -hmm. partly because, you know, they're some of the lowest paid in the nation. So this is a problem that we are seeing here in Missouri, too. And it's unclear how much these mail restrictions are actually going to help solve the problem. Mm-hmm. And, and Shayla, as you reported, they do come with a real cost. And, and you talked to some people with some thoughts on that. One of them was Chris Santillian. He spent uh, nearly three decades in Missouri prisons. He told you he depended on letters as a lifeline to human contact. He says he can't support a policy that alienates inmates even further from the world that they're hoping to eventually rejoin. If you take that away and you, and you place another degree of separation between a person and their loved ones, I don't see how that equates to becoming more human or, or getting back in touch with their, their humanity. I think it, that would have the opposite, which would go against what corrections is supposed to be. And that is Chris Santillian who spoke to you, Shayla. You know, hearing him talk about that, it it made sense to me. I think we've all sort of had a letter that we sort of savored as a physical object. There's a real sense of like you're you're holding on to a memory when you get mail. Is that something that people are concerned that goes away if you're just looking at some digitized copy of things? Yes, absolutely. I think that's something that I've heard from, you know, both criminal justice advocates and then also people who were formerly incarcerated like Chris Santillian. Um, They're really concerned about this change, um, partly because they're worried that this, you know, that digitizing mail is basically just putting one more barrier in between incarcerated people and their families. um, And that, you know, that it dehumanizes that process of communicating even more when we know that those kinds of family connections are, are critical 
for rebuilding a life when someone leaves prison. You also spoke with Clinique Chapman. She's the associate director of the Vera Institute of Justice's Restoring Promise Initiative. And she stressed this is a real loss for people in prison. It just takes the humanity out of it. So receiving mail and seeing handwriting, right? If someone's child is is sending something to you, you know, being able to even feel potentially like the texture of the crayon from when they, you know, they drew an art piece or, you know, like smelling home, you can smell paper at times like, oh, wow. Like, you know, this, I can smell my mom's perfume on this letter, right? And that's Clinique Chapman. Shayla, she told you the only group likely to benefit from this policy is the company being paid to scan these letters. What can you tell us about the company that's going to be doing this work? Yeah, so the company that will be doing this work um, is Securus Technologies. So it's a telecommunications company that works with prisons. It's actually one of the largest prison phone providers in the country. Their yearly revenue is somewhere around $700 million. And Mm. they contract with thousands and thousands of correctional facilities all across the country, including Missouri. Um, And I think it's worth noting here that this is a company that has continued to grow year after year and basically just kind of kept on acquiring more and more companies that do this kind of work. Um, So about seven years ago in 2015, Securus acquired JPay, um, which provides these free electronic tablets to thousands of people in prison in Missouri and then elsewhere across the country. Um, And these templates are kind of like a modified iPad. So incarcerated people get them for free, usually upon intake. Um, And then they pay certain fees to access content on them. So they can send emails. They can download certain movies, music, books, um, make phone calls in some cases. Um, And so beginning this summer, that's how they'll also be reading their personal mail is by by looking at these scanned images on their their tablets. Hmm. So this is kind of big business going on in these prisons. There's there's a real profit for Securus there. I also Mm -hmm. know from talking to people who've done time in Missouri prisons, they really do love these tablets. They they feel like this is a great thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I'm wondering about mail, though, um, being in the hands of Securus. Are there privacy issues at play here? I mean, it's interesting to think about these letters that could be really personal, maybe sitting on Securus's servers. You know, that's definitely something that um, the criminal justice reform advocates that I talked to raised an issue that, you know, what is happening to this information? And I think that One of the points here is that, you know, traditionally, corrections officers are reading your mail if you're incarcerated. So you're giving up some of your privacy to the state when you're in prison, right? But what we're talking about here is pretty different. So with this new change in Missouri, um, inmates won't have any other choice but to share their private correspondence, their private letters with this third party for-profit company who will then take that information and store it on its servers. Um, And so before this segment, I I got on the website for the parent company of Securus, um, and they outlined pretty specifically on their website all of the different forms of private information that they collect from incarcerated people um, and their families. Hmm. But I think the question is, you know, how exactly are they using that information? How are they monetizing it? Um, How long are they going to store it? And I think all of that is kind of an open question here. Well, Shayla, this is such an interesting story now happening in Missouri beginning July 1st. I want to thank you for joining us today. I also want to encourage people, you can read Shayla's full story on this. That's at stlpr.org. Shayla, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. This episode was produced by Danny Wissentowski with audio engineering by Aaron Doerr. The production intern is Avery Rogers. This podcast was mixed and edited by Avery. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks.
St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at ChooseWood.com.